Hello everyone and thank you for joining us today for this webinar on social media. This webinar will be presented by one of our senior consultants, Mr. Ed Case, who has been with Foresight for many years. Throughout his career and for more than 20 years, Ed has been focused on strategic marketing and business development, helping companies understand market conditions and implement go-to-market strategies. Ed received his MBA from Colorado State University and also holds a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Clarkson University. Now before we get started, I'd like to ask that everyone please keep their microphones muted and if you have any questions, please type them into the chat box and we will answer them during the Q&A session at the end. All right, at this point you can go ahead and start, Ed. Okay, well good morning or good afternoon depending on which time zone you happen to be sitting in. Today I just want to talk a little bit about social media and how that is important to companies that are participating in the SBIR program. And, and I realize that there's a, a broad spectrum of people that have you know, been established companies for years, maybe have had multiple SBIR awards, and there's also people at the other end of the spectrum that are, are relatively new um, companies, newly founded companies, and are maybe just getting started with SBIR technologies. So one of the reasons that it's in, it's in your best interest to establish some type of social media presence is one of the goals of the SBIR program is commercialization. And there's a lot of ways you could accomplish that goal. So you maybe um, have an idea that you need investment in order to really springboard and scale quickly. You may decide that you don't want to run a company per se, but you may want to license technology out. You may decide that you want to be even more distant from things and you just want to outright sell the technology when it gets to a point where it's proven in the market. You may decide that in order to really approach the market, you need a partner to fill in any of the, the gaps you may have expertise-wise or that has a, a solution that complements what it is you do in the market. Or you may decide that you want to be a, a going concern, own your own sales force, and go forth and you know attack the market. So for any of those strategies, it's important that you have a, a, a credible presence out there in the world that these potential customers, partners, um, investors can look at and get comfortable with you. And they're looking for things like, you know, do you really exist? So um, particularly for some of the early stage companies, you know, they, they've gotten the award, but they ne haven't necessarily established a corporate presence. They may still be very closely associated to a university or a research organization. And as you're asking people to partner with you and spend money with you, it's important that they know that, that you're committed and engaged in this commercial enterprise. So that's why establishing a presence that's beyond um, just having won the award is, is important for you. And it's also important that somewhere out there in the world it looks like you solve someone's problem, that you understand the technology, and that you have some credibility in the area of expertise that your technology addresses. So these are kind of all reasons why the outside world may be looking for you in places that you may not expect like social media. So you know the first thing is you kind of need your anchor out there in the world and if you're if you're a company that has an SBIR the first thing in your company presence is a company website. And we're not going to spend a lot of time on that aspect of your corporate presence, but um, that is the thing that you need to focus on. And along with your company website, you want a LinkedIn page for your company, and you also want LinkedIn profiles for the principals in your corporation. So those could be people that have the, the business acumen that is going to make you successful, um, founders, key technologists. Um, in particular, because we are, you know, this audience is SBIR focused, you want to make sure that your principal investigator is has a, a fairly complete LinkedIn profile that demonstrates their connectedness and credibility within 
the area that um, the technology addresses. So just to touch briefly, you know, the, the big thing with your web presence is your company website. Got to be there. It's kind of a, a, a got to have to get into the game. And it's important, just like in the SBIR process, where the advice is when you do your commercialization plan that you look beyond phase one through phase two and kind of give a, a well thought out step by step plan for your technology. It's also important that you do that with your business. So there's a lot of tools out there. Um, one I like to, to recommend is the Business Model Canvas from Strategizer. is a way to build a business model so that you can pull out things like your value proposition, which is going to be crucial to getting your message out there. And when I talk about a value proposition, it's more in terms of what problems you solve as opposed to what your technology is and what features it has. So as you shift to the commercial world, you want to be more solution oriented and customer focused and less technology focused and um, inward looking in the what you communicate to the world. So once, you, once you've built that value proposition, start to create some content. Um, it can be anything from just the the pros on your website, it could be case studies, it could be white papers, um, it could be uh, links to content like presentations you've done at conferences, papers you've had published, but pulling together all the pieces that kind of um, establish what your core competencies are and represent you as a company. I'm just going to talk about search engine optimization is, is a big thing. You want to be able to, to have your your site found. Um, that's probably a topic that lends itself to a whole webinar on its own. So I'm just going to touch on it and leave it to you that as you're building a website or having one built for you, have those kinds of considerations in mind. So your goal here is to get your message across and to appear with a corporate presence out there in the world. So kind of going along with that is what should your, your LinkedIn presence be for your company? So it's very easy to, to establish a corporate page. Um, as you're starting out, um, I would suggest that repurposing content from your website is an easy way to do things. Um, it makes sure that things are consistent and it keeps you from having to necessarily create uh, multiple sets of content as you go out there. And you know, early on, I would use it as a gateway to your corporate website. So while you talk about your company there, um, I think it's, it's fair to redirect people back to the corporate website so that um, that depth of information is more appro appropriately housed there rather than trying to build something really complex in a LinkedIn forum. So LinkedIn is, is the first social media we're going to talk about, and we're going to talk about that um, for a large part of this discussion. Um, other things that go on your LinkedIn page, uh, as your employees join LinkedIn, they will show up um, on the, the right-hand bar of the, the LinkedIn page for your, your corporation so people can look at individuals. It's a good place to put um, current news and events if you're going to participate in a conference, if you've just had an article published, if you have content you want to share, um, presentations, videos, good place to, to host some of that is from your uh, LinkedIn corporate page. And because LinkedIn is all about networking, this is where you really want to um, actively get people to look at your site. So people you're connected to, people that your employees are connected to, um, other people in industry, people you share interests with, um, invite them to follow your page so that as you make additions to your page, it starts to show up in more people's LinkedIn feeds as, um, as, as news that they may want to be aware of. So. Um,
So now if you've established kind of your corporate presence, it's, it's important to highlight who works for your company, what are they good at, um, how do they contribute to the technology that you deliver, um, what, by partnering with you, what expertise might they be able to leverage. So that's where it's important that, you know, if, if you've got a strategy that says you're going to build a distribution channel, it might be good if you have someone that's a, a head of business development that has a profile that strongly suggests that they've had past success in doing things like that. Um, if it's obviously the technology is important to make sure that your key technologists appear connected, that they have the right, um, don't take this the wrong way, the right credentials, that they've you know, got an education, that they've had past success in the field, that they've um, network with other people, they've worked at other companies, they're connected to people who are um, have some standing in the industry. The, the last bullet is is talking about board members and advisors and what's very common with particularly with early stage companies is that you may not have all the expertise in, encompassed in the staff that you start a company with. So it can be really important to get advisors who can talk to you about how do you establish a distribution channel or how do you do contract manufacturing overseas or you know the, the pieces that are going to become important to your business it's good if you don't have that directly in the business that you seek outside sources that um, you can solicit advice from that can lead you to success in those areas where you don't necessarily have a depth of expertise so um, I always recommend that people try to make sure that if they have advisors, even if they're informal advisors, that somehow they're identified back to your company because those people will show up as links off of your corporate page. So now as we start to look at the, the actual um, individual pages, I think it's important to include a photo, and there's a couple reasons for that. Um, one is if you're going to network with people at conferences or other types of networking events, it helps them place you after the event when you may reach out to them to for a sale or for advice or for a partnering opportunity. So I think it's important that, that you're recognizable. I mean, the one analogy is to, to think about the person at a cocktail party with a bag over their head. You're probably not going to spend a lot of time with that person and you're probably not going to remember them or have an ongoing relationship with them. So put yourself out there. Um, a picture, professional dress is, is important. Um, your personal headline does not have to be your current job title. Um, I tend to shy away from titles that don't say a lot like being chief of ideation or something like that, but you know if you can say um, expert in um, a certain type of cell line production or something like that if you're in a, a pharmaceutical company, something that, that very succinctly gets your expertise out in front of people. So this is how you're introducing you. So it's the same way um, if someone comes up to you again at a conference and says, hi, I'm, and you give your name and someone says, well, what do you do? Your headline is a great way to, to get that across succinctly and right at the top of your profile so people understand why you're someone they want to be connected with or why you're someone they will look to as an expert. So the other thing that you're trying to, to build is kind of a, a value proposition for you. Why do people want to be connected to you? What can you provide to them that they need? Either is it a solution, a product, consulting expertise. So making sure that your, your profile is pretty complete as far as your experience, your accomplishments, um, any academic degrees, publications, um, and they can be you know journal publications, they can be presentations at industry conferences, um, if you have patents, it's important to, to get that information out there. Uh, any awards or honors, you know, if you've been been awarded something, you know, by your university, by your organization within your industry, 
if because of some of your expertise or company has gotten an award, you can, you can list that here or you can list that over on your corporate page. But this is, this is where you're kind of building your value to the network. Um, so it's important that you're complete in, in what you present so that people can identify um, where the value is. Because LinkedIn is focused on connecting in a professional network, um, be proactive in connecting with people. So if you have you know, coworkers, former coworkers, colleagues you know from conferences, um, I think it's important to, to make those connections and have them visible. If there are particular um, companies or if there are particular industry influencers, um, you can follow those and those will all show up in your LinkedIn profile. I really encourage people to join groups. You'd be amazed that for a lot of different disciplines there are a multitude of groups. And when I encourage people to join groups, I have them first look at some of the larger groups and the ones that have a lot of activity. Um, there's not a lot of benefit to joining groups with few members or that are fairly stale as far as the content. But find groups in your industry that um, exist and join them and become active in the discussions in them. If groups don't exist, you can start a group and you can invite people to join a group. So um, groups are a great way to not only make connections, but they're a great way to do market research about technologies and um, trends within your industry. So, so I encourage using the Yahoo, or sorry, the uh, LinkedIn group activity as a way to get out there and get better connected. So most people on LinkedIn uh, tend to look at profiles without being anonymous. And how you connect is depends on how deeply or how engaged you want to be. So if someone views your profile, I have a tendency that I will go and view their profile just to see there was an interest there. Is there a, is there a connection that we should be making? If people want to connect with you, um, Again, it's up to your discretion. Some people accept all connections. Some people are very selective. Most people are somewhere in between. So, you know, if someone asks for a connection and you view their profile, if it's obvious they're in the, your industry and it makes sense to connect, um, I always accept. If you're not sure, you can always message them um, outside of the, the whole connection mechanism and just kind of ask them, you know, Got a got a connection request from you. Just wondering, you know, what your your goal is in connecting with me, um, and you can decide to decide things that way. And and sometimes if it's obvious that someone's just out there to to connect so they can get access to your network, um, you may just decide to refuse to avoid clutter and to avoid, you know, possible, um, I'll say, bandwidth filling up with with people you're connected to, then going on to to approach your connection. So. Um, it's good to be proactive, but it's it is a professional networking environment. So um, be considerate and, and don't connect with people and immediately try to sell them something. It's great to start a discussion, but um, it's not good etiquette to connect with someone then and immediately say, "Great, do you want to buy my product or service?" So just some some considerations there on connecting to people. So I talked about this a little bit, but when you join groups, um, be active. It, you know, I, I think that there's a lot of benefit to asking questions in a group, answering questions if, if you have the expertise, sharing content. And that can either be original content or it may be something you've seen in a different site that you think is, is pertinent to that group. You can link things into it. So. Um, the whole purpose of groups is to share information. So anything of quality that you think you can share, um, be active in your group. And in some groups, um, I had this, this instance where I asked a question and based on the discussion that followed, suddenly I was a group influencer, even though I was the one asking for information as opposed to providing it. So um, it, it is a way that you can raise your visibility um, in social media. 
with LinkedIn, it does give you the option that as you um, post things on LinkedIn, you can automatically post things to Twitter. And that's a great way to, to get out there if uh, Twitter is a forum that you want to be involved with. And when I say that, depending on your industry, some people are really active and want a lot of activity. Um, some people want to see very few posts but more focus on quality. So it, it's important to kind of understand what your industry is looking for so that you don't overwhelm people but you don't appear stale or out of date. So in the same thing on, on Twitter relative to, to connections, you know, decide how active you want to be, um, who do you want to follow, um, look at who follows you, see if there's, there's value in uh, some type of connection or relationship beyond um, just Twitter that is to the, the benefit of, of both of you. So um, Twitter can be a, a useful um, activity, um, but it can also become overwhelming. So uh, I leave that to, to each individual to kind of decide what their their level of commitment is to Twitter. Facebook's another one that I think it's it's very um, valuable for business to consumer type enterprises. So if you're trying to get word out there, um, if you're trying to do promotions or let people know where product is available or um, make announcements about new features, I think Facebook is a great venue for B2C type um, communication. I think a lot of businesses that are more business to business type operations do have Facebook pages, um, but I don't think they I don't think you'll see as much traffic there, and you'll probably see more focus on events like talks they're giving, demonstrations they're doing, um, webinars that they're going to be presenting. So with, with B2B, um, I think that you keep things probably on a, a more professional level than possibly a, a B2C type enterprise will when using Facebook. Um, and some people do it to show kind of the human side of their company. So there may be, you know, pictures from your company gatherings, your, your picnic, your Christmas party, or whatever. Um, but I always um, emphasize keeping it professional on Facebook, whether you're business to business or business to consumer. So a lot of people capture videos. People do videos where maybe you've been, you've given a webinar, maybe you've um, presented something at a conference and it was taped. Maybe you're doing product demonstrations. Um, maybe you're doing instructional videos. So YouTube and Vimeo are both out there. I think YouTube is probably um, more prevalent, but it gives you a way to um, get additional information that's more um, rich content out there to um, your potential audience. I encourage companies, if you're going to do this frequently to actually do a, get a YouTube channel so that your videos are all kind of collected in one place. Um, a great use of this is instructional videos. You know, if you have a piece of hardware that requires setup or calibration or you've got a process that has a workflow to it, it can be a great way to introduce people to something like that. Um, and by having things on YouTube with videos out there, it can improve the um, your rankings on Google. So the more links you have off of your website back to your website can improve your um, your search engine optimization. So there are other advantages to, to having things out there um, as far as videos. And the same thing with SlideShare. Um, SlideShare was acquired by LinkedIn a couple of years ago, so it's actually part of the, the LinkedIn umbrella. But if you've got um, presentations you've given, you know, slide decks, um, PowerPoint or, or PDF slide decks, SlideShare can be a great place to get them out there. Um, reference them on your LinkedIn page, reference them um, on your website, but it's a way to, to share information in yet a, another forum. So um, I encourage people to do a lot of things with um, kind of rich media content or at least media content that's hosted elsewhere but available from 
your social media sites as well as your corporate website. This is a little off the topic of social media, but um, another way to get your content out there is through webinars. And there's kind of two avenues you can do there. You can do self-produced webinars. You can, can do one hosted on your website, um, record it. There's a lot of tools out there where um, doing things self-produced uh, can be very beneficial and doesn't require a lot of labor. The other side of the coin is you can do industry-sponsored ones. Um, I worked with a company and we happened to do a lot of things with IEEE Spectrum, which was a, a media source that was very widely viewed in our industry. Some of the advantages you get to that is in the case of IEEE Spectrum, they'll do promotion on your behalf. So they will go to their, um, their subscriber base and invite people to view your content based on interests that they've indicated. So webinars could be a, a great way to reach a broader audience that you may not currently have contact with. Um, usually when you do these webinars with um, a media outlet, they are hosted for some period of time, so they exist. You can reference them and link to them. Um, they can be expensive. There's likely a fee required. That fee can be on the order of you know, five to $10,000. Again, they're doing all the promotion for you. You're providing content. They're moderating the whole thing. So you really have to look at what, what your anticipated return on investment is. If you really need to get, you know, potential contacts into your database, it can be a, a great way to do that very quickly without the expense of traveling to a conference or trade show. Um, but there is a cost associated. So always go into those types of things with a, an anticipated return on investment so that you've got something you can measure against, decide whether it was successful and whether it's something you might do in the future. So. Um, so as you look at, at, at all these options I've kind of laid out there, and, and again, it was kind of heavily involved with LinkedIn, but we did talk about some of the other social media. I think it's important to realize that um, Foresight has been around for about 35 years now, and we have a depth of knowledge of the industry, and we've evolved with the industry. We're pretty well connected. So if you're looking for you know, those partnering opportunities or licensing opportunities or um, identifying who the, the key influencers may be in your market, there's a lot of content and connections that Foresight can bring to you to help you as you're, as you're starting out promoting a technology. The, there's a number of services that they provide. Um, either on behalf of some of the funding agencies or directly that fill out some of the, the expertise you may not have in-house, whether it's business development or market research or partnering opportunities. So one of the things that Foresight can, can do for you is um, connect you into the industry and give you some of the, the things that you may be, be lacking in when I say that, there are things like as you move from a phase one to a phase two, a simple example is your commercialization plan goes from a couple of pages to 12 pages. And the, the depth of market research that you may require um, is something that Foresight could be a partner to you in providing some of the, the content you need as you try to grow your business. So that's really everything I wanted to cover today. Um, and I guess at this point, Alyssa, we're going to open things up to questions. Great. Okay. First off, thank you very much, Ed. And we already have a couple questions that were submitted. And if anybody has any other questions at this time, please um, enter them into the chat box and we will answer them. So first question we have is, um, everyone knows me from my university research. Why do I need more than the pages on just the university's website? That's a good question, and that's a fairly common instance, particularly for, for the early stage SPIR companies, 
is they probably come out of you know academia or some of the research institutions. People know you, but it may not be everybody you want to reach. So certainly your peers know you, but is that where, are all your customers going to be familiar with you if that's your your avenue is to, to go to market directly? If you're going to be looking for investment, you know, do investors look at university pages or are they going to look in a more kind of corporate setting to um, as they're as they're assessing technologies they may invest in. So think beyond just your your current community and think about what your commercial potential is and where your potential customers, potential partners, or potential investors are going to be looking to find out information about your technology, the quality of, of the research you do, and kind of the value you provide. Okay, great. So, somewhat along the same lines, but um, people in my industry don't really use social media. Why should I bother? Yeah, that, that's along the same lines of, of how the question I just answered. So, the, the people that, that you want to connect with, as opposed to the people you are currently connected with, may have other venues where they gather information. So, while they may read um, conference proceedings and journals, they're also going to look for, um, again, the, the more corporate signs that this is something that you're really invested in moving forward with. So they're going to look for a corporate website, and they're going to look for some social media presence. So it, you have to think beyond your, your current circle of influence and think about the potential targets that you want to reach, whether those are customers or investors or partners. Okay, excellent. So here's another one, a little lengthy. Um, I am a part of two different industries. One is heavily predicated upon social media, of which for the past number of years I have saturated the market through SM, I'm guessing social media. However, my personal business is a part of a different industry, of which our first product is primarily geared towards government. It doesn't really need a major social media presence. How do you recommend I balance the two industries? So I'll, I'll approach the, the second part of that. I, I think even for you know government entities, um, whether it's you know you're doing direct business with the government or you're you're trying to get funding through programs like SPIR or other other grant type or contract vehicles, um, I, government buyers do look at corporate websites and do look to see you know, they're interested in in any vendor that they're going to do business with that there's a good possibility of an ongoing relationship. They don't want to partner with a technology that potentially is going to disappear. So I think it's important to to still have a presence out there. It may not be require the same level of activity that you get from um, other sites where social media is a large part of what you do. So, um, so I think it's important to, to be on social media to to provide content at whatever interval makes you appear fresh as opposed to having stale content. But you know you may focus more of your social media in your first business, but I think it's important that both of them have a presence that's out there incredible and current in terms of whatever that means to the industry. So maybe on the government side you're only saying I'm going to this you know these six conferences these years. You're only you're only updating things a couple times a, a year. That's that's fine. The social media side, you're probably more active. Okay, great. Um, how do corporate leaders and in investors view business owners who use LinkedIn for professional communication and Facebook as a more personal communication? So I think this is more of just an opinion. Yeah. Um, So investors are going to look for whatever is out there. Um, personally, I I use link or I use Facebook very minimally. So, to an investor, I wouldn't have much of any of a Facebook footprint. Um, but if you've got a very public 
Facebook profile, um, people are going to see it. So it's just, it's the same advice they give, you know, college students looking for their first job. You know, don't necessarily have stuff on your Facebook page that may not be appropriate or may not paint you in the best light for a professional situation. And on the LinkedIn side, um, I keep it professional. I don't I don't encourage people to share um, personal opinions, political opinions, religious views, um, social activities in LinkedIn. LinkedIn is more about you know LinkedIn is the is being at the cocktail party at a at a conference as opposed to you know being in something that that's more socially open um, but I would tend to not have my Facebook profile very open outside my network but that's that's my personal view of Facebook okay excellent um, what is your opinion of SEM or social uh, or or I believe that's search engine marketing. Um, so I, I think it's it's important. Um, you know, I work with some people who, who their entire focus is digital marketing and search engine optimization. Um, it can be a very valuable resource to make sure that your content is found easily and that um, you are it's found appropriately so people are using keywords that are appropriate to your industry and that you rank highly with those so that um, there's that you don't get that feeling that you showed up at the, the wrong place um, you know if, if typing in misleading or having misleading keywords that bring people to your site for something you don't really offer isn't good but being highly ranked for things you do is very important and a joke along those lines is where's the best place to hide a dead body on the second page of a Google search. So a lot of people don't get beyond the first, you know, eight to ten entries that show up on your, your first page. And they, they certainly don't get I mean, I do a lot of internet searching for for market research, but I don't go more than five pages deep typically. So you want to make sure that you've you've done things appropriately and, and I always recommend if it's important to you it's worth spending money on. So if a consultant's going to help you get ranked appropriately for the technologies you want to be known for, I see great value in that. Okay. On to the next one. So is it important to list outside funding sources and financial awards on your social media? Um, I think it is, but particularly for, for LinkedIn. Um, while you may have a particular technology, if you've got a body of work or if you've been recognized um, through a particular grant or maybe you've won um, an incubator competition or a pitch competition, all of that says that um, you're a going concern, that people see value in what you provide. People, you know, if it, if it happens to be a, a pitch competition, that people see not just a strength in your technology but some strength in your your business plan that says that, that this is a going concern. So I think it's very valuable to um, put all of your expertise out there. If some of your previous expertise is in a different field, you may not emphasize it as much, but it, it's important that um, as you introduce you in social media that people understand all of the talents that you might be bringing to the enterprise or the product or the technology. Great. And just to add to that, too, I, I think it's also good to maybe, um, you know, tweet out if there is a uh, promotional article about you receiving funding or some sort of press release. It's, it's good to get it out there on even Twitter and, uh, you know, get the conversation going with, uh, with your followers. Um, okay. So what about other products, services, and technologies that the company has already brought to market? Should those be promoted on your social media? As long as they're current technologies, they should be. I mean, if you've got um, what I'll call legacy technologies that you're not really focused on, I probably wouldn't emphasize them as much, but I would, I would let people know they exist because, again, um, people are looking for solutions. So I think you want to present the whole portfolio of 
um, competencies and expertise that you could potentially bring to solving someone's problem. So um, if as long as is but again if, if it's not current, I would probably underemphasize it. But if, if it's in a related field and if it's a technology that's, that's fairly current or maybe it was a building block to where you got to, certainly emphasize that and um, talk about how that you know, gives you something closer to a whole product. So a whole product uh, is a concept that rather than just having a piece of the solution, you have multiple pieces and you can kind of knit those together appropriately, whether it's all product or a combination of product and services to deliver a complete solution as opposed to part of a solution. So I think it's important that as long as things are, are current and relevant that they that you present the whole palette of what you might be able to, to bring to, to bear on a problem. Great. Uh, looks like this is the final question here. So um, if anybody has any other, feel free to enter them in the chat box. So. Does receiving third-party validation of the technology and or the business plan uh, help for social media promotion? It, it does. As, as Alyssa said, you know, tweeting things like that, um, putting announcements on your website, announcements on LinkedIn, um, and linking out to those sources. So if it happens to be an award you got from a publication, um, creating a number of links into your website from making people aware of those links raises your search engine optimization. So there's a number of reasons why it's important to um, to emphasize those things and announce them, whether it's through tweets or press releases. And again, to try and let people know the, the breadth of the technology that you have and what people's reaction are as far as um, how viable it is as a solution, how pertinent it is as a solution. So I think it's important to um, to get that third-party validation recognized. Um, and, and even if it's for your technical staff where they've gone out and they've gotten certain certifications that may be key in your industry, you know, it's important for them to, to add those to their profiles. And I think it's important as a, as a company to recognize accomplishments of individuals as well as the corporation. So. Um, I definitely recommend that you you get that out there um, in whatever social media venues make sense, but certainly Twitter and, and LinkedIn um, make sense as well as your own web presence on your corporate site. All right, looks like that is it for the questions. Uh, first of all, thank you, Ed, for presenting today, and uh, thank you to everybody that joined us. Uh, we do these webinars uh, once uh, once a month, usually. Uh, we look forward to seeing you at future ones. If you have any questions, Ed has his contact information there, and we will also be sending out the recording of the, um, of the webinar here today uh, in the future. So thank you again, and we look forward to seeing you soon.